Welcome to our panel on innovation in traditional industries. It goes without saying that innovation is key to the long-term success of any business. Innovating in every part of your business can drive competitiveness and growth. And it's through innovation that Nova Scotia can leverage its strength in traditional industries to continue to be powerhouses in the future. Let me get things rolling by introducing our first guest, Scott McCain. Scott is a highly regarded Canadian business leader with strong family and business roots in Atlantic Canada. He is president of JSM Capital Corporation and chairman of McCain Foods Limited. He is a champion of junior league hockey and has been honorary chair of both Bobby's Hospice and the Canada 55 plus games. He's actively involved in several local charities uh, and charitable initiatives and is currently co-chair of the More Room for Love campaign for Ronald McDonald House Charities Atlantic. Scott, you're going to kick us off with a few thoughts on innovation, adopting a continuous improvement mindset, and what you can do for your sales and profits. Over to you and welcome. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to I want to thank um, you, Laurel, and the team for inviting me. Um, the subject of innovation is is really very very important, and uh, my comments will be based on my experience with. McCain Foods and Maple Leaf Foods together. So I have about three points I'd like to make. First of all, an innovation, uh, innovation in our world that I'm used to is, is really not, it's not an event, it's, it's, an, it's a process. And in order for this process to be successful in your organization, uh, you have to look at it from a very broad perspective. It's a cultural shift. Uh, a lot of a lot of companies think that innovation is is well, I'll launch a new product or I'll launch a new service, and th and those are important, very important, but it doesn't capture the whole um, necessity of what innovation can do throughout your organization. I think uh, a lot of us that have been down this curve. Are, are looking at innovation as something that can impact a supply chain, uh, your purchasing techniques, your manufacturing products and practices, your sales techniques, um, your organizational structure, your the use of human capital, uh, how you how you go about your IT processes, and all of these things. When you look at it through the lens of innovation can have a huge impact on your business. So that's point number one. Point number two, um, in our business at McCain about eight years ago, we looked at innovation from a different perspective. And today we would call it more simply continuous improvement. Uh, it's dramatically changed our business. Uh, we've, taken, we've taken costs out of our whole structure. We've looked at different ways to approach our revenue line and uh, quite frankly if you look at your revenue line and your cost line in most businesses you're probably 85 or 90 percent of the way there in terms of driving innovation so these are really 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 important areas for to, to focus on and and if innovation is scary to you as an organization then then use the word continuous improvement and the best thing you can do is make sure that your organization, every each and every day they come in, they have to be thinking about how do we continuously improve. And that's every facet of the organization that I just mentioned in, 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 the, in my further comments in point one. And finally, my point number three is about growth. Um, I think in Atlantic Canada, we tend to be a little more nervous moving outside of our boundaries. And all I can say is that back in my history with McCain Foods, my father started the business along with his uncles about late, late 50s, early 60s. And then within seven or eight years, they were looking outside not only Atlantic borders, but uh, in Canada, Canadian borders, but also international borders. And so when you look at that perspective, we have to have the confidence as Atlantic Canadians to to treat growth as something outside of our own region and have that confidence to do it. So that would be my final point for this session. Uh, 
Let me just get my mic going here. Thank you. Um, so let's get um, Eric and Lori, if we can, back in. And thank you, Scott, um, for that overview. And now we're going to have a chance to uh, to pull into some real good discussions uh, about this. So let me introduce our, our next two guests that are joining our talk show conversation that we have, the four squares, perhaps, we'll call ourselves. Um, Lori Kennedy. Lori has been the co-owner of Lewisburg Seafood since the company's inception in 1984. Uh, her work with community, industry, tourism, academia, and government has led to innovative corporate policies and procedures that govern how Lewisburg Seafood operates within the fishery. Uh, Lori has a deep appreciation for the industry and started in the fisheries plant, as I understand, a graduate of Cape Breton University, you are incredibly well respected in your community and uh, as a leader and a philanthropist. So welcome to this conversation, Lori. Thank you very much, Laura. Eric Fry. Eric is the president and owner of Sandler Training Maritimes. He previously worked in sales and leadership roles for organizations that include Xerox, Stables, ABM, Integrated Solutions. He's a native of Sydney, Nova Scotia holds a Bachelor of Commerce degree from St. Mary's University and is a board member for Entrepreneurs Organizations and has also held board roles with United Way, Junior Achievement and Fall River Basketball. So let me welcome Eric and let me start with you, Lori, uh, to begin our conversation. Can you share with us what innovation means to you? How do you define it and why it's so important to you? Well, at Lewisburg Seafoods, I think um, where we are a family community oriented business and we have a great story and storytelling is very important in terms of the innovation piece. But because we operate primarily in uh, rural communities, we deal directly with the fishermen, the fishermen and their vessels. So traceability is very important. So because of that special relationship that we have with our rural communities and our fishermen were able to um, trace their seafood, actually catch the plate. So um, we actually catalog each individual fisherman's identification numbers, CFB numbers, and we actually know the vessel by name, you know what kind of bait they use, fuel. So we have control of the seafood at all stages of production, from the catch into our processing plants, uh, processed, and then off to our uh, customers. So we feel that air, we produce a high quality seafood and uh, that's really important with the traceability piece because not all companies can actually have the ability to actually trace the product from the catch to the plate. And so we're high on sustainability of regulated based on science fishery. And that's becoming really important, especially to the consumers. And for instance, you know, Generation C, they have an obsession with truth and uh, authentic. And we have the story and we are authentic and uh, we are the real deal. And our seafood is remarkable. Um, we um, support our communities um, and it's just so different and so special. And you know, after 35 years, and I was a foreign fish plant worker as well, so I know how important it is, you know, to um, engage with their employees. And uh, for instance, just near communities, I want to mention something that's really important to us is there's a breakfast learning program. And that program is, um, we provide the resources so the um, students can, we provide, breakfast for all students throughout the entire school year. And we've been doing that for 20 years. And we do know that some students do not have food at home uh, for whatever reason. And um, we know that they have breakfast, lunch, um, they take some food home through this program. And this, it's so important for us to know that we are doing things like this. And we are able to do this because of the direct relationship we have with our community, the sustainability piece, the control of the product, um, sourcing it in the Northwest Atlantic. All that together just creates a unique company such as Lewisburg Seafoods. And we are the real deal. 
and we do produce some of the best sustainable seafood in Canada. I know you guys are the real deal, Lori. Uh, and um, those are, I mean, you've laced in all of these innovations. Who would have thought about traceability years ago? But that's, that's critical now. Um, innovating for the benefit of community. Um, all of those pieces. So let's bring Eric into the conversation now, as I know you guys, you know each other well. I mean, Eric, one of the things um, that we talk about is how do you teach uh, to think innovatively? How do you teach businesses to do that? You do that every single day. Um, and I know you've had to innovate and uh, change your operations as a result of COVID-19. So just share with us that philosophy of how do you get traditional industries to want to learn about different and new and innovative th ways of doing business? Sure, yeah. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here, Laurel. Uh, thank you. But uh, yeah, I guess just a, a, a quick uh, a snapshot of, uh, of us. Yeah, I, I think it was last fall when, um, you know, we, we, had a, we had a big training center in our Bedford location. And uh, uh, so people would come to us literally on a daily basis and weekly basis, and we'd have all kinds of trainings and that sort of thing. But anyway, I got sick and tired of walking by the thing and it was, there was nobody there because of COVID. And so we actually uh, pivoted. I know that's an overused word. We'll call it adapted. Uh, and so now we deliver everything online. Uh, we've been doing that for years anyway to a select group, but now 100% of our business is delivered virtually. So literally on a weekly basis, we're training people from all over the world, which really uh, you know, uh, broadens our reach for sure. So what we're finding is that salespeople, leaders, even non-sales people, professionals like engineers and accountants and lawyers, they're struggling um, with not being able to go to face-to-face -face meetings or, or conferences or trade shows and, and you know, uh, share their wares. Uh, so they come to us to leverage digital platforms. And this is a great one, by the way. Uh, but, you know, things like Zoom and Teams and, and uh, the use of LinkedIn. So a lot of social selling tools kind of built in there and woven into a more traditional sales strategy to modernize it and to adapt to the times. No, that's great. And maybe we'll bring you into this, Scott, because I know uh, one of the things you said to me in our pre-conversation was people can do better everywhere. They need to look sales, expenses, profits, processes. Build on that a little bit, because I know you're passionate about the sales process, but you're passionate about looking at all the cracks and corners to do better. You know, you know what, it's a fascinating subject. In the old in the old days, I say the old days, call it 10, 15 years ago, people, uh, your employees were you know expected to come to work and kind of do their job, and that's and that's all important. But today's employee, whether you're on the front line, and Lori would know this because I've worked on a manufacturing floor for years. I was in, I did all my career in manufacturing, so I understand the plant floor. But the expectation of people today is different. It's that. Not only do you do your job, you have to look at ways you continually prove every day. It's not just when your boss tells you, you always have to have an open mind to change, to continuously improve whether you're doing your selling, your, your cost structure in your factory, your purchasing technique. All of your employees have to buy into this cultural shift and attitude of continuous improvement. And Innovation is just part of that. You could innovate in your plant. You could put a piece of equipment in that changes. Uh, and, it's, and these aren't easy. And, and a lot of companies don't embrace it because change doesn't come easy. People don't want to lose their jobs because there's a new piece of equipment. Uh, people don't want to change the way they do things because they're familiar. They're afraid. But co companies that don't innovate and find new selling techniques, manufacturing techniques, purchasing, all these things that I've throughout your whole organization will struggle longer. Well, let me let me come to you, Lori, because I know you've said similar things because this the phrase that you gave me was innovation is everywhere and should be in everywhere. Um, look around. 
Um, so, so give me your perspective on how do you get you, how do you get your operation to think that way and to be open to innovation in every aspect and also expand it beyond the immediate um, operation into community as well. Well, we do know that um, the community is important. So women um, have 87% of buying power and they're the household CEOs. So, um, and, and social media, Instagram and Facebook, what have you, um, they share the stories and, and they like to know where their seafood comes from. And they like to make the connection of the story. And so we do know that, as uh, Scott had mentioned about equipment, and we do know that retail is here. Some of the next norm is here. Some things will stay, and it's going to be the smaller portions and targeting, you know, chef at homes, the moms and dads. So we talk about this all the time, and we know that, you know, we got it right without 37 years ago when we started to build on the community and we realized, hey, wait a minute, we're tugging at the heartstrings of the moms who are going to the grocery store to buy for their families. And then they say, well, wait, a we are so involved in the community and this is out there. And that's a very important um, piece. And, um, you know, where, for instance, they're more a uh, buying power. They would look at the, you know, the authentic. Um, care for the community, a respectful sourcing of your seafood. And that's what we talk about throughout the entire company all the time. That's great. And Eric, pulling into what Lori's just been saying, because that's right up your alley. How do you take that authentic um, customer driven relationship and expand it in this new virtual world? And when you maybe don't actually know the people anymore and, and some of that relationship aspect um, that is so important to us in Nova Scotia, how do you do that in this new world? Yeah, that's a great question. And you're right. Relationships are key here in Atlantic Canada. Uh, uh, not that they aren't important in other parts of the country, but exceptionally important here. And here, here's what I know that more than half of what we communicate to other people is through body language. All right. And the, and the effectiveness of, of body language and, you know, here I am moving my hands all over the place and eye contact and, and gestures and that sort of thing. And that creates a bond. Right. I can see you smiling and laughing and that sort of thing. But it's so important to engage with people. Don't do it over email. Second would be, uh, you know, phone. I can't remember the last time I had a phone call. I do 100 percent of my sales like this right? Over Zoom or over Teams, if they want to use Teams and that sort of thing. Don't miss that opportunity to engage with people, uh, to build a relationship. Uh, innovation is going to come from growth and growth is going to come from stretching our comfort zones. So we need to get out in front of this and embrace it. You know, this whole pandemic stuff, I believe we got to look for that silver lining. And a lot of businesses, believe it or not, are flourishing right now you know scott mentioned a couple at uh, at the early on the outset there so i just think we need to put ourselves out there get over that comfort zone hump and embrace some of the tools and the technologies and the uh, and the uh, the techniques uh to build a relationship virtually it'll save you a whole lot on phone on um, uh, flight costs that's for sure why don't I come to you, Scott, because I know you're passionate about this, because you have told me that there is opportunities to build even better relationships with our with customers in this new world. Um, so so talk a little bit about that. Well, I think uh, I think Eric summed it up. Um, look, lots of lots of people have been negatively impacted by this pandemic. Don't get me wrong. But there's a lot of people look at this as don't waste a good pandemic and mm. and take a look at the positives that have come out of this and how do we uh, implement those techniques into our business to make us better and, and this, this the whole idea of communicating with customers through a computer who would have thought a year ago we do this but look I, i've talked to so many executives and i know my brother and the ceo of londales who was our former ceo they're all looking at their business with a whole different lens of 
connecting with customers and our employees in a whole different way that is, that is meaningful to them as well. I mean, look at Atlantic, Atlantic Canada's got a huge opportunity here because you don't have to live in Toronto or Montreal or Vancouver or Halifax for that matter to be to, to be able to work in a company and add huge value. <clears throat> for instance, I can give you another example. We're going to go to a hybrid model probably where people can work from home a couple of days a week. Well, we wouldn't have thought of that a year, a year ago. We would have said, are you crazy? You'd be at your office at 8.30 and I'll see you until five and call it a day. That's That won't be acceptable going forward. Yeah. In our view. So these are these are all positives that this pandemic has driven businesses to look at innovation differently, how they do, the, how they do their work. Yeah. Well, for sure you would know about this, Lori, because you've been on trade missions with me. One of the things that we've learned through the pandemic is you, people would say you have to come into market. I mean, the travel into market was absolutely critical. When you can't travel anymore, you can still connect and we're having all sorts of bilateral discussions over Zoom and Teams and platforms like this one. Um, and it can actually be more regular in some ways because you could only get on so many planes and go so many places a year, right? Scott, Lori, you know that. But now you can be in China in the morning and France at lunchtime having those meetings, right? It opens up the world in a lot of ways. If you knew, if you knew how much time is lost in airports and travel <laughs> and how much time you could re-effectively deploy that on a call with your customer to, for five, 10 minutes, You'd be a no-brainer. Yeah. Let's go to um, technology and innovation. And Lori, you were talking about um, the uh, catch to plate. Um, can you give us a sense of, I mean, how have you in your organization had to embrace different types of technology to be able to drive innovation? Well, I think um, where we deal directly with the fishermen and the vessels. And the, so we not only have four processing plants, but we actually have about 14 out rural community ports that we, our employees travel to uh, for the day, record their catch, supply them with the things they need, the fuel, what have you. So we're able to, we, in many cases, you know the names of the dogs for God's sake, in one uh, port uh, in Lower Rain, there's um, one of the dogs, we used to bring him down biscuits and it turned out we dropped a piece of mackerel on the ground and he, that's his favorite snack, who would have guessed, right? And he would show up every time his um, owner would come in the harbor, like he could tell with a sample vessel. So we have all these, you, and so it's easy for us to have the traceability component and we catalog each individual fisherman with a CFE number, his vessel name. Um, it's the traceability piece is quite easy for us in the messaging because we are a community family oriented business and we do deal directly from the catch to the plate. Yeah. So we can try to use that out. We have the technology, we do the data collection, we're you know, regulated based on science. Like I said before, we're the real deal. And, uh, you know, so for us, the social responsibility feels like it's common sense on and off the ocean. Right. So, Eric, let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk about um, how do you, because you're in the business of training and we all in the pivot adaptation world, we all need to learn new skills. Um, mm -hmm. How do you work with traditional industries businesses who have long histories and convince them they need to learn something new and do something different. Because sometimes we think we know what we're doing and we don't want to change. Isn't it funny? Yeah, Scott mentioned that earlier. You know, some people just don't like the change. And and I'll point out one word that you just used and that's uh, convince. Um, my belief system is we don't need to convince. It's not our job as salespeople to, or sales professionals to convince somebody because that naturally kind of brings a, a bit of an opposition uh, discussion where we've got to push them over that finish line. 
my belief is that whether you're a commodity-based business or you've got all kinds of other products and services, uh, we need to get out of what we'll call the vendor space, which is very transactional, little in the way of relationship, uh, not really setting ourselves apart. And when we're doing that, you know, perceivably your prospect or client may have three or four options from which to choose. And if we're all the same, price is probably going to be the driving factor. So it's a race to the bottom. So my belief is that we need to set ourselves apart. Sales is a slight edge business and we need to be that slight edge and be more of an advisor. So you know, whether you're a traditional business or a brand new, you know, SaaS startup, uh, we need to be different. And I believe that the time that we're in right now is a huge opportunity for us to embrace this and set ourselves apart to be different so that we're seen more as an advisor, we're seen more as an extension of their industry or their business, and price moves way down the list. That's great advice. Scott, how do you, um, sort of following along this line, how do you encourage um, people to be more willing and more accepting of risk? Because if you are, if you are, have an absolute risk aversion, you won't tackle some of these things like innovation or doing things differently. So, so you know, what's your advice for the businesses who are online and listening to us today and, and want some real tips to take away? Uh, what do you have to say about risk taking? Look, uh, that's a very good question. Risk taking is all in the in, in the minds uh, and the DNA of whoever's taking the risks. My risk profile would be totally different than yours and Eric's and Lori's. Um, what what I find in in Atlantic Canada, and this is from uh, meetings I'm involved in the Wallace McCain Institute, which uh, uh, basically takes in 30 entrepreneurs every year and I do a lot of mentorship in that space. And I'm shocked at the number of Atlantic Canadian businesses that are, they're really afraid of risk. And in some cases, it's, it's, it's probably warranted, but I would argue that it really comes down to a lot of the entrepreneurs that are just, they're afraid and they don't have that confidence that maybe it's because they're from parts of rural Atlantic Canada, uh, maybe it's their economic circumstances. I don't know. It'd be, it's probably a combination. But it, it's shocking that they just they just lack that confidence to take the risk to say I can be just as good as the supplier or the, 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 my competitor from Quebec or from Western Canada or Ontario or the United States. And I have to I have to look at my businesses and I'm as good or better than anybody else and I'm going to be better than everybody else. And it's it's like competing in a hockey game. If you go into the game and, and you don't feel you can win, then you won't win. You just won't win. You have to have a competitive drive and mindset and confidence to take that risk. And it, it doesn't happen overnight, but the Atlantic Canadians, they, they lack, it's not being critical, it's just they're more cautious. Uh, and But I would argue they need to get out of that cautious zone a little bit and, and try to find the, the way forward to take more risks and prove to everybody else outside the region that we, we are the best in the can. And we are, and we should celebrate that. We should celebrate it. And Lori, I suspect from following the journey of your business uh, that, that you might have a different perspective than Scott has, uh, certainly in your own experience. Um, have the confidence, take the risk. You guys had confidence and you took risk. So how do we get there? And and what's your perspective on that confidence risk question? Well, um, when we started out, uh, Jim and I down on the wharf with six employees, we started as just a job. Hmm. And and uh, we would offload fish and truck it out. And then we thought, well, gee, we're plant workers. We can process the fish ourselves. And, and we bought one plant and we started, you know, it was a tough, I mean, over 37 years, but we never really thought about getting up in the morning and fail. We just get up and went to work. We never really thought about failure and we just kept reinvesting and um, just branching out and buying our first vessel. Um, I would, there was no fear if you, in the risk, we didn't look at risk. It was uh, no fear. 
You get up every day and keep going. So no fear. Eric, what's your perspective? Risk, confidence, no fear. How do we teach that? Well, listen, confidence is, uh, you know, anybody that comes into our program, A, has a natural level of skepticism, right, as far as, uh, uh, you know, is this really going to help me? Uh, and B, it's, it's you know, there's 80% of the people that come into our program that are lacking confidence, whether they're a business leader, a CEO, uh, an inside salesperson, and that sort of thing. I mean, we all have our own head trash. We all have self-limiting beliefs that are holding us back. Right. So it's we got to isolate those and identify them and put a system in place. It's amazing when you follow a system. I mean, look at the systems all over the place. Unfortunately, not enough people in our belief have a sales system or a true, you know, workable leadership system. So once you put that in place and repeat it, rinse, repeat uh, and practice it and really kind of role play it in real life scenarios, that's when confidence starts to go up and you're willing to take more risk and innovate your business. But you got to get that baseline in place as far as I'm concerned. Good advice. I Oh, Scott, jump in. Yeah, look, I love what Eric's talking about. And it's funny, this is a dig to the universities. Um, I don't think they're, they really, in the business programs, they're really drilling down the importance of selling and building confidence. Uh, you know, when I went to school, they talked about, as I mentioned earlier, the marketing programs, and there's the strategy programs, or yeah, there's this and there's that. But no, no universities are teaching selling techniques, whether they be used in selling a product or a service or selling your ideas. Just sell your ideas to the people that work with you or for you or above you. Yeah. But selling is everything. It's true. Selling and, is uh, everything, we don't, right? We don't, teach it, we don't teach it in universities to the degree that we should. So I know we want to get to some questions from the audience, but I want to um, come to each of you now. And one of the promises and commitments that we made to the business participants who are taking a whole day to spend with us is that they would get some takeaways, uh, some things that they might be able to write down in their notebook right now and then take away and act on. Um, so I want to pose this to each of you. I mean, when you're in business, there's ups and downs. Um, and and some of those things are very personal. And this has been a sort of a particularly challenging year, but it doesn't matter. In business, it's always up and downs. It doesn't matter what year. Um, so how do you, what advice do you have for Nova Scotia businesses on how to manage their way through the ups and appreciate, manage their way through the downs and appreciate the ups? Because the other thing is we don't perhaps do enough is appreciate uh, what we have and what we've got. Lori, can I come to you first? Sure, yeah. So uh, my advice would be to build your networks, talk to people. For instance, it's funny, you had just mentioned about a trade mission, and I sat down and one of the participants, she was a millennial, and I sat down to have a chat to get her to just think about her company. I said, why would you buy our seafood? And she said to me, because I love the story, it makes me feel homey. Just tell your nice. story and be authentic. And things will fall into place you know authentic leadership is required here today great scott how about you what's your advice before we get questions two, from the audience two things that two things that i think entrepreneurs need in a, in a really important way is is as Lori touched on the importance of mentorship and um, an advisory advisory connections um I mean, it's it's shocking that when you when you're down, my daughter's an entrepreneur, and I guess I might be one of her mentors, but she has two or three others, because they don't always want to listen to their parents, which is quite normal. <laughs> um, and so having a mentor for them to go talk to through those lows is really critical. And if you don't have them, you know, you know it's it's an important part of being successful. And the second thing is is we need to celebrate our, our wins. Um, in Lady Canada, I find it frustrating, and I'm not slamming it, but when somebody's really successful, other people look at them suspiciously as if they were, you know, what, what did they do wrong, or how did they, somebody must have helped them do it illegally, whatever. It's just, it's not right. And we, when somebody's successful, we should be saying, 
thank goodness, how can we help them? Because that could make me more successful and celebrate those wins instead of beating each other up. It's a, it's just shocking. So that's mm. it. Thanks, Scott. Over to you, Eric. Um, what's your advice? Um, some stuff that someone's going to write down on their notepad right now and say, I'm going to do this tomorrow. I'm waking up and I'm going to do this. Well, I, I think one is, uh, listen, we're all passionate about what we do. At least we should be, right? Uh, unfortunately, sometimes that passion can get in the way. And nobody take this the wrong way because I lump myself into this. People care less about your products and services. People care more about the problem that you can solve for them, right? And those are two different things. So if we're out there and we're just pitch, 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 you know, my product does this or my service is that, it kind of falls on deaf ears. And we talked about the difference of differentiating, right? So, uh, so focus on the problems that you solve for other people and then your level of engagement will go up. Second one's a little deeper. Uh, we all have our identity, which is us, our value system, our belief system, that sort of thing. And then we have our roles. If we're failing forward, we're gonna mess up in our roles from time to time. And I would encourage everybody to mess up in your roles and fail forward, but don't let that impact your identity because then it starts to mess with up here, right? Uh, we're all rock stars in our own regard, right? So keep moving ahead with your roles and uh, things will, you know, even themselves out. That's my belief, Laurel. Great. Great advice. Um, let's see. I know the audience has tons of questions. Let's we, Our system lets some pop up. Let's get a question popped up here on the screen. Okay. We discussed innovation from a product and productivity perspective. How will innovation on pricing models Example, subscription services, what will that have on local businesses? Good question. Who wants to jump in on that one? Maybe Eric? Sure. Uh, well, listen, we, we, uh, we all, uh, some people call it MMR, some people call it recurring revenue, whatever we want to call it, but that builds a healthy business. So the more that we can, uh, you know, uh, uh, build our business based on repeatable revenue, then that means two things. You're gonna have a healthier business and your client is more engaged with you over time and you're providing better value and services. So if that's the subscription model that this person was talking about, I would highly recommend you know, doing whatever you can to, uh, to put a, a pricing model that is uh, consistent and, uh, and drives uh, regular revenue versus a one-shot deal. Anybody else wanna jump in on innovative pricing models, sales models, Scott or Lori? Well, just go ahead, Lori. I think it's all about branding too. So if you have a unique, different product and you have the traceability and the, who as air products are, they direct from the Northwest Atlantic, they are directly with the harvesters, um, care and control of product from catch to plate. And if you can prove that, and this is a truth in the branding, so your product deserves a higher price and people are willing to pay more for your product. If you are sustainable and authentic and you're telling the truth and you um, care about and source, you care about the, how respectful resources um, sourcing your seafood. Yeah. Scott, you want to jump in on this? No, yeah, no, just quickly. The, we, had to, we had to pivot because of the closure of restaurants when I moved to the products that were more friendly for uh, delivery because uh, you could some restaurants and places still produce food but you had to either pick it up or they deliver so you know when you're in when you're in selling you have to continually pivot as Eric did in his business to accommodate the needs of the customers what what, the, what you can do to help make them successful and as he said very properly in business it's it's about making your customers success more successful they they, they like you in the relationship but what are you going to do to help solve their problems? Yeah. And so you've got to adapt your organization, pricing, delivery, distribution to accommodate your customers. Great. Thanks. Let's get another question from the audience. Okay. Uh, will you continue to do a lot of business virtually even when travel restrictions are lifted? What do you think? Do Are there things that we've picked up and learned during COVID-19 that we're going to keep around with us uh, for a while? Um, Eric, let's, let's, let's start with you and then go to Laurie and Scott. 
Sure. I, I think, uh, and Scott mentioned it earlier, I think what we're going to see in the future, you know, once everybody's vaccinated is a blend because listen, we've had a massive cultural shift and it's not going to turn back overnight. I can tell you that people are realizing that they're much more productive in certain environments and not in others. And you can't fight that. That's going to be fighting society. So for my business, we're going to keep going like this as long as it makes sense. Maybe if I need to spin up another uh, uh, physical space, I will. Uh, probably won't be on a long-term lease with a big honking uh, uh, training room. It'll probably be on a more of a rental one-off basis when needed. So that's 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 my future. Lori? Actually, um, I feel like I'm sitting in at my kitchen table with you, which I really like that piece about it. Um, but also it accommodates uh, the women. So... And, and families, they can stay more at home and pick their hours. So that's a great piece too. So I think uh, they'll be, yeah, at home for sure. There's great no point. Point. And I think it's great too, it, it, ironically, it came upon us. So. Great point, Scott. If you, if you could own a subway in, or a bus in the city of Toronto, or it doesn't matter, Vancouver, Halifax, it's 6.15 or 6.10 in the morning and an hour and a, an hour and a half to work, shoulder to shoulder, on the way there, on the way back, two hours a day of lost time in your life. And you could do business with those two hours and edit on technology that changed through this pandemic. Wow. <laughs> I can drive up, I can go to my office in 10 minutes, it used to take me 30 traffic yeah. it's 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 profoundly changing the way the business is going to be done and once you have that relationship that face-to-face -face and that trust with your customer they really only want to see you and say look talk to me let me see your face then get out of here i got other things i want to do <laughs> lots of time wasted in travel it's unbelievable yeah and we try to have some fun but uh uh, there's a lot of downtime, that's for sure. I know the audience still has more questions, so I think we can try to slip in one more question. Uh, as a new product-based business, do you have any suggestions on how to make those first point of contact relationships with potential merchants that have not embraced the new types of technology? That's a great question. Um, how do we do that? Who wants to jump in with an answer on this one? Scott? Well, the, 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 most of the marketing now is moving more to digital. Um, and you're seeing it more and more through Instagram and Facebook and all these things. And I'm not, I'm not on any of them. But um, you're seeing more and more of it as opposed to the traditional marketing and sales techniques. Yeah. Eric, want to jump in? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, if they haven't embraced this this new technology, I'm assuming you mean the Zoom or, or that, that sort of technology. Um, look, uh, you know, if you've got a website, um, uh, you know, marketing and sales, I believe they're two very different things. Marketing is like the air assault uh, and sales is the infantry and they both need to, uh, you know, be integrated together. But I think the messaging needs to be consistent, right? Uh, and the messaging is problem focused versus features and benefits dump. So, you know, reflect your marketing on your website to be problems focused versus, hey, we do this, 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 and this. And it's, you know, flash and glitz. So uh, I'd probably start with that. But uh, I would also, you know, challenge your clients and, and, and suggest that, hey, look, um, if this is very easy, I'll send you a link. Uh, and uh, click on it and we can actually speak with each other. Maybe it's the head trash of the person who's asked the question, I'm not sure, but uh, I would get out in front of this. Lori, uh, thoughts on that? You know, I, it is the social media platform that they would have to engage in. I think that's, you know, I'm just actually echoing what Scott and um, Eric has said. And um, yeah, that would be, a product lodge for sure, depending on the product, of course. Yes. Great. So we only have a minute left and we're gonna do a really super lightning round. Um, we talked about confidence. We talked about that we've got this here in Atlantic Canada. I'd like each of you to give a message to our businesses um, that you know gives them that, that push, uh, that encouragement that they need uh, to, to go the next distance. Scott? 
uh, it's all it's all about confidence and uh, believing in yourself. I'm I am so frustrated that Atlantic Canadians oftentimes uh, think that there's other people in other regions that can do it better, and they will be true, but don't admit it. And look, come come to work every day. With, I'm going to do better. I'm going to change every little thing I do in my business, and I'm going to be better than everybody else that I compete with. Full stop. No matter where I'm from. Great. Quick last word, Eric and Lori. Uh, stretch your comfort zone. Look, if I can do it, you can do it too. So just embrace it. Get out in front of it. Great, Lori. I think that the um, you know you're leaving your employees, and your employees will leave in you. And there's always opportunity, and there's a great opportunities with this pandemic for sure. That's great. Thank you to all of you. What a great conversation. Uh, thank you to our uh, presenting, uh, our co-presenter, ACOA, and our partners, BDC and LAE. Thank you so much for this conversation today. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everybody.